Okay. So a very excellent question was asked during the break. Um, we're studying Hebrews chapter 6 right now. I'm going to read verse 6 because it directly relates to the question that was asked. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto the unto repentance seeing they execute to themselves the son of god and put him to an open shame uh the statement where is it it was in verse four the statement is one long sentence for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the holy spirit and have tasted the good word of god and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away again to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they execute again to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Okay, that's the quote that, that developed the question. And the question was, how do they shame Jesus Christ? By falling away into apostasy. It's an excellent question. The answer is, this goes back to the commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We've been told, I don't know about you guys, so I'll just speak about myself. I know I heard all of my life that to take the name of the, uh, of the Lord in vain is, is to speak his name when you're not preaching about him or, you know, like a curse word. Like, you guys have heard them. You know what they are. So while that's possibly true, that's not what the scriptures are talking about. This is what the scriptures are talking about. When God gave the command, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Why? Because this is why the scriptures in another place refer to us as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. When you're walking around calling yourself a Christian, one who is like Christ, if you're apostate <laughs> and the world can see that, they can see the hypocrisy, they can see the contradiction and so on. What puts the name of the Lord to shame and his sacrifice to shame is you are misrepresenting him. You are causing shame to come upon the name of Almighty God when you walk around carrying his name, but you're acting like the devil in whatever form. Does that answer your question, Sonia? Sonia? If you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, that's um, very enlightening and very deep and actually really makes see things in a different light thou shalt not take the lord's name in vain wow yeah thank you absolutely thank you for the question fantastic question all right let's continue um i really want to get through the rest of chapter six because it's it's really important for leading into chapter seven, but I'm for the sake of the recording and for time, I'm going to skip to the end of, of chapter six. Uh, even though I, I hate doing so because I don't want anyone to think I'm trying to take things out of context. So let me, let me go to the end anyway, just as I said, for the purposes of time, let's go to verse 15 of chapter six in Hebrews. And so, after he had patiently endured and obtained the promise for men truly swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife or dispute as your version of scripture says sonia wherein god willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability or the unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable or unchangeable things in which it was impossible 
for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. This is a reference to the priesthood. When we went through chapter 6 the other night, I made mention that only on one day a year could the Levitical high priest enter into the most holy place, sometimes referred to as the Holy of Holies. It was on the Day of Atonement. He would make atonement to sacrifice before God for the sins of the people. It was the only day he could enter it, and no one else but the high priest could enter there. But this is telling us in Hebrews six nineteen. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil, whither or where the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that's the opening of the next chapter. This is the context of the next chapter. He's talking about the priestly service. Now understand that it, especially for a Hebrew person listening to this, their thought is immediately going to go to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and is going to say to themselves, wait a minute, only not just any Levite, of the tribe of Levi could be the high priest. It was a specific subset of Levites called the sons of Aaron. Only those descended from Aaron, the first high priest of the Levitical order, only they could be the high priest and only they could enter the Holy of Holies. Yes, yes you may ask a question. My sister has a question. Um, Speak up though for the <laughs> sake of the recording, please. Um, if it's only the family of Aaron, does that include, like, um, married into, so like a, a, a son-in-law or something, or is it just no. straight up bloodline? they had to be directly descended from Aaron. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay. So chapter 7 is going to address this. Okay? So this is, he, the writer of Hebrews is building a very logical argument here. Going block by block in laying a foundation of understanding. So they're having to refer to this older older way of doing things in order to make sure that the Hebrews they're speaking to, why this is called the book of Hebrews, they're speaking to Hebrews, help them to understand who Jesus is and what he does for us and how. That's, that's what the author's trying to get us to understand. So I wanted to touch on that he the, the writer is saying here jesus this high priest is not a levitical priest he's of a different order of priests the order of melchizedek and the the writer is going to continue from there as we go into chapter seven so here we go for this melchizedek king of Shal shalom or salem jerusalem priest of El Elyon, Almighty God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, so a tithe, of all that he had. First being by interpretation, so the writer's now interpreting for you, what does Melchizedek mean? Continuing in verse 2. First being, by interpretation, king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. And primarily, that was his job. That was who he was, the office he was operating in. And after that, also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. What does Isaiah tell us? He lists off a whole bunch of things that the Messiah would be called, one of those titles is Prince of Peace. So the writer of Hebrews is, is asking us to remember this, this encounter that Abraham had with Melchizedek, the king of 
Salem. Again, building building a point here, block by block, brick by brick. Verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. The, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that this Melchizedek, Malachi Zadik, which whole other rabbit trail we could go through on that at some point. I think there's a hidden priesthood that is going to be revealed during the millennial reign. I'll just tease you with that right now. For the purposes of this study, we do not have time to chase that down. But somebody remind me sometime and give me a day to prepare for that. And we can do a study on that if you would like. But for now, made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. So the writer is telling you that this Melchizedek that Abraham met on his way back from the battle of five kings against four, where he rescued Lot and all of the other people of Sodom who had been taken, um, taken captive by Nimrod and his army of Nephilim kings. On his way back, Abraham goes past Salem, which later would be called Jerusalem, and meets this Melchizedek. And that Melchizedek never shows up again, like face to face with somebody. But the writer is telling you who this individual is. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. So this is an immortal priest, king of righteousness, and king of Salem. With no, why would the writer say that this King Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life? Why would they say that? Because remember what happened right before that in Genesis. See, the writer's talking about Genesis 14, I think, where Abraham meets Melchizedek. Thank you. It's yes. In the chat. 14, 17 through 19. Thank you. So what did Genesis tell us right before the story of Abraham begins? The table of nations. The table of nations. This priest isn't listed there. Not anywhere in the table of nations. No genealogy laid out for this king of Salem. This king of righteousness. But the writer is telling you they know who this Melchizedek is. So let's continue. Uh, Hebrews 7, verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And truly, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the statutes, that is, of their brethren though they come out of the loins of Abraham. I simplify this. Now he's mentioning a different priesthood. This writer is mentioning a different priesthood and saying, making a specific point, they descend from Abraham and they do what Abraham did when he met this Melchizedek. He, they, get, they take tithes. Now he continues. Verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So in other words, think of ranks. Melchizedek outranked Abraham. So Abraham recognizes this. And gives tithes to the one who outranks him. Does that make sense? Uh, 
Anybody? Yes. Okay, thank you. Verse 8. And here, men that die receive tithes, but he, there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. It's witnessed that this Melchizedek lives. Verse 9. And as I may so say, Levi... Yes? Sorry, the phone cut out just when I was about to um, ask. How can Abraham um, be outranked by uh, Melchizedek? Isn't that like saying apples and oranges? Abraham wasn't a king, and he also wasn't a priest. So where does rank come into Actually, I don't understand why would he tied full stop. Okay. Let's address the issue of rank. Again, the, the writer of this book, the book of Hebrews, is talking to Hebrew people. It's where the book gets its name. You have to understand the depth of study that the Hebrew people underwent at this point in history. By the time they were four, five, six years old, they were already being taught the Torah. They had read it all of their lives had it read to them, extremely deep studies. So these are questions they would have been asking as well. But to the Hebrew mind, Abraham is a king. You have to understand the land grant and the promises that were given to Abraham. They've never in the history of the world received the fullness of that promise yet. But those promises belong to Abraham and to his seed after him. That seed is Jesus Christ. But yes, he has many more descendants than Jesus alone. So when God came down and told Abraham that Sarah was going to produce an heir for Abraham in their old age, Isaac. One of the things God mentions is he's when speaking about Sarah. No, 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 no. You're not going to have the seed of promise come through a handmaid. The seed of promise is going to come through your wife, even Sarah. Kings will descend from her. Kings will come from her. Okay. So you have to understand this goes to the concept of divine right kingship, which I've spoken of in depth before. For anybody who might be listening to this recording, I will try to keep it brief. But essentially, I mean, do your own homework. Check it. Don't, don't just take my word for it. I'm going to type in chat. Look for this. Salic Law. S-A-L-I-C. Salic Law. It's the laws of kings. Abraham was created a king through the promises of Almighty God. Therefore, all who descend from him are royal heirs according to the promise given to Abraham. In the ancient world, and really even to this day, the entire thing that allowed or authorized kings to be boss, I'll just keep it simple, Everywhere around the world, this is the idea set that entitled kings to be kings. It's called divine right kingship. I'll type that in chat as well. Divine, if I can get my cursor out of the way there. Divine right kingship. In other words... A person did not qualify to be king unless they descended from a god or in some other way were authorized by a god to lead as king. The king in the ancient world, we've lost a lot of these understandings in the modern world, but the ancients knew this full well. The king was the earthly representative of the god that he served. So now what does this have to do with Abraham? Abraham was given these promises 
Go back into Genesis and look at the promises given to Abraham. The land grant that he was given and the, the covenant that he had with God. He was created a king by Almighty God, i.e. he qualifies as a king under divine right kingship. He was God's authorized representative on the earth in his time. Therefore, all who descend from him are royal seed. What did God say through Moses when the people went to Mount Sinai and received the covenant there? You shall be a kingdom of priests forever. What are we told through Jesus Christ? This gets into the engrafting. This gets into what Paul talks about is grafting in to the cultivated olive tree of Israel, the wild olive branches of the Gentiles who were not the seed of promise until they accepted Christ Jesus and received the gift of adoption by which we call Abba, Father. We've been adopted into the family of God grafted in. In the ancient world, it was a law, particularly in Rome, that when an adoption occurred, legally speaking, there was to be absolutely no difference between an adopted child and a natural born child. So that if you happened to adopt someone who was older than the natural son that you had, that adopted elder son now becomes the heir. What am I telling you with all this information I'm throwing at you? Abraham was a king. His descendants are royal. And when you got grafted into the cultivated olive tree of Israel, you're not a wild olive branch anymore. You've been adopted into the family of God. Guess what? Congratulations. Today you just learned your kings and queens, priests of God forever. No one can take that away from you. You have divine right. And when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning there for a thousand years, we are promised. The writer of Hebrews is going to get into these promises in just a minute. The promise is you will be kings and priests ruling and reigning with him forever. You have a destiny is what I'm telling you. This is why when I talk about the battle of five kings against four, where Abraham and his party threw down Nimrod and his group of giant kings, it's why I call it the battle of five kings against four with the hidden king. Because Abraham was a hidden king. God's chosen representative on earth at that time. Did that answer your question? Beautifully. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I know I can talk a lot. So I don't know when it's too much. So if it is too much, I'm sorry. I'm just doing you know, doing it the only way I know how. So have some grace for me, please. And and I know that please you have. Don't apologize. There's no need for an apology. We're blessed. Okay, let's continue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up a little because I've completely lost my train of thought at this point. So I need to regather it. Uh, Hebrews 7 verse 8 and here men that die receive tithes but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives and as I may so say Levi also, Levi also who received tithes paid the tithes in Abraham for he was yet in the loins of his father Abraham when Melchizedek met him Look at the way the Hebrew people think. Look at the way that they think. Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. So they're saying, 
What the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that the order of the Levitical priesthood was less than Melchizedek because they paid tithes while still hidden inside of Abraham's loins. These were his descendants, right? He had not produced Isaac yet, let alone his grandson Levi. But the writer here is saying Levi was hidden inside of Abraham still. And Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. Therefore, Levi, hidden in Abraham, also gave tithes to the priests that outranked them, Melchizedek. Does that make sense? It does. Um, so the Levites, in a sense, were they weren't the first priests, right? Melchizedek was. They were yeah. a stand-in. Stand intercessory here on earth until Christ came. Yes, precisely. Because, because it twisted my mind when you, uh, your sister asked the question about, because Jesus is not from the line of Levi, right? Right. He is from the line of Judah. Yes. And so the writer of Hebrews is going to address that. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the Torah. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the priestly regimen. That's a mind-blowing statement. I'm not, it's so big, I'm not even going to address that right now. I'm going to wait and let the writer of Hebrews explain it to you. 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. In other words, we've never seen someone from another tribe offering sacrifices at the altar of God. Only the descendants of Aaron. Okay. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Judah was never mentioned about the priesthood through Moses, only the line of Aaron. Continuing in verse 15, and it is yet far more evident. For that after the similitude or the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the regimen of the commands of the flesh, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalms 110.4, by the way. Verse 18, for there is truly a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. He's about to explain why it was weak and unprofitable. For the priestly regimen made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw near unto God. This better priesthood draws us near to God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, the Levitical priests, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, Yah swore and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 22. By so much was Yeshua, Jesus, made a surety of a better covenant. He's the down payment on a better covenant. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Otherwise, Aaron would have stayed a priest forever, right? But he was mortal because of the sin virus, as I call it. Mortal. Not allowed to continue, neither any of his descendants. They die too. 
but this Melchizedek has an endless life. So he's priest forever. Verse 24, but this man, because he continues ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God. I lost my place. That come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. He lives forever making intercession for us. He doesn't ever go away. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Never. Verse 26. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily, he means sacrifices, as those high priests, Levites to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once when he offered up himself what did God tell Abraham when he, Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac hurt not the lad I will provide myself a sacrifice and then Abraham finds the ram with its horns caught in the thorn bush. Where, where did Moses meet God for the first time? Burning bush. Thorn bush. What crowned Jesus on earth just before he was crucified? Thorns. Yes. Yes. He truly is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Twenty eight for the Torah makes men high priests which have infirmity, but by the word of the oath, which was since the Torah, in, in other words, it's hidden in the Torah. We just covered a piece of that. The Son is consecrated forevermore. High priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Does anybody have any questions or comments? So in short, just the way that the sacrifice is being done in the Levitical law were a stand-in until the fullness of Christ had prophecies had played out, so mm -hmm. were the priests to stand in to present them. Yes. And yet, God also promised that the order of the Levitical priesthood would be priests before him serving continually forever. So while people want to say, we're not under the law, that was done away. Tell that to the Messiah when he's ruling and reigning in Jerusalem for a thousand years and there are temple sacrifices going on in the third temple while he rules and reigns you have to deal with that unless you're trying to call ezekiel the prophet a liar i mean you know i wouldn't recommend that but you have to wrestle with this god is no respecter of persons and it is impossible for him to lie so what do you do with that I think it's because there's going to be a mortal seed pool in the millennial reign. Maybe those sheep that he talks to. Lord, Lord, when did we do these things for you? When did we feed you when you were hungry? When did we clothe you when you were naked? When you were sick or when you were in prison? When did we visit you? What does he say? When you did it to the least of these. So he's talking about another group. These, my brethren, you did it unto me. Come enter into the reward prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
I think there's going to be a mortal seed pool that will need atonement for sin as they learn the ways of God. Because when they say, Lord, Lord, when did we do these things for you? It means they didn't know they were obeying him. So now they have to learn his ways. And that fits in with a lot of other prophecies all throughout the prophets. Like, come, let us go to the Mount of God, to the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. Right? So my point is, God's not done with the Levitical priesthood. He has a place for them. Whatever it is. Whatever that's going to look like, I, I don't claim to know. I'm just as human as the rest of you. I'm still trying to figure stuff out, too. But it's what it says. So do I believe him or not? I believe him. It's up to him to figure it out. Good news is I don't have to, right? It's I'm not the king. I'm not the king. But praise God, we have a king. Ruling and reigning right now. And standing in the gap for us in the heavenly tabernacle, the new Jerusalem's holy of holies, making intercession for us continually. Our compassionate high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Eternal to eternal. Everlasting. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what Jesus said. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, I have one. Sure. I uh, I think so because uh, when our resurrected bodies, uh, I don't think we could be tempted, but Satan's let loose. Uh, who who who's that for? Exactly. Exactly. Deceives the nations and gathers them together at the end of the millennium to make war on God, and then they get devoured by fire. Yeah. Who's that? Exactly. Anybody else? All right. Then I propose we close out this recording for now. And you guys can let me know if you want to continue into chapter eight. Or if you want to call it good for the night. What What is the summary or the extent of chapter eight? in addition to clarifying what we just went over? Uh, give me a second. It talks about what Jesus does as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and why he's not operating as a priest here on earth. Talks about a better covenant. Why there needed to be a change in the priesthood from the Levites to the order of Melchizedek. That's basically a summary, like really brief summary of what it goes uh, over. I, I would say let's go ahead and finish it up after you take a break. It's uh, only 13 verses. Yeah. If that's okay with you? That's perfectly fine with me. Okay. We'll take a five or ten minute break here and we'll return with uh, chapter eight.